Hi and welcome to Midnight Cry. I'm your host, Ron Mugasane, and today we have with us Jay Smith, who will be discussing with us about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. First of all, welcome to the show, Jay. Hey, it's good to be here. Now, in the last episode, we were discussing some of the problems, especially with the late dates. Are there any other problems with the life of the Prophet? Prophet Muhammad. It's a good thing you brought that up, Rommel, because there are other problems. Uh, the late dates are difficult enough, and that's problematic enough because that suggests that almost everything we know about the Prophet Muhammad comes from such late dates that we cannot, should we even trust it? Uh, as a historian, not only should we not trust it, we should, uh, we should be careful about anything we accept from that classical account because mm. it could be open to embellishment, it could be open to all kinds of oral tradition because it's all based on that oral tradition. And what happens when you get oral, oral tradition, you tend to get a lots of contradictions. And there are lots of contradictions uh, within the, the Prophet's life. Al-Tabari is probably the best one to go to. Al-Tabari is the first one to have compiled the what we call the tafsir, which would be uh, the commentaries that explain this Quran and unpack the verses there so we can understand the background uh, for all the different stories and all the different references in the Quran. He dies in 923, so everything he writes about is from the 10th century. But what he does is he takes sources from many different, uh, uh, well, many different accounts writings or, or accounts. Uh, yep. We don't know if they're writings because nothing's written down, obviously. Mm. But he takes the, the sources from what he has at hand there in the 10th century. He takes a little bit here, a snippet from over there, another snippet over here. And many of them are contradictory. And he just leaves it for the reader to decide which are the more authentic ones. <laughs> of course, the problem with that is how do you know with, with whether anything is authentic if you're not getting this till the 10th century? That's right. Three, two to 300 years after the fact. Let me give you an example. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen so you can see it. And this concerns a account of Muhammad as a child meeting a religious man. Dr. Patricia Corona writes this in her book, and it was fascinating. She looks at these accounts, and there's actually 15 different accounts of this meeting with this religious man. And in some cases, you will find that this account uh, takes place during his infancy, according to Ibn Hisham. Uh, at another place, Ibn Sham mentions that this happens when he was nine years old. Ibn Sa'd contradicts that and says this happened when he was 12 years old. Ibn Sham then comes back and says, no, it happens when he was 25 years old. So you have four different ages mm. for that meeting. Ibn Sham mentions that this was seen by an Ethiopian Christians. Abd al-Razak said it was oh, by a Jew. Abd al-Razak then says, no, it was by a seer. Ibn Sa'd says, no, possibly it was by a Kahin. So you can see even contradiction as to who this person is that he's meeting. And what about where it happens? Abd al-Razak mentions this has happened probably in Mecca. Abu Nu'aym says it happens in Uqaz. Abu Nu'aym then, then actually contradicts himself later on and says it happens in Dual Majaz. So what does Patricia Coron conclude? Well, she concludes that what we have here is nothing more than 15 equally fictitious versions of an event that never took place. That's right. I mean, there's not... Uh, even two that would marry up, two that would corroborate the same story. I mean, that's... And that's just one example. Yes. Al-Tabari is full of these contradictory examples, which suggests to me that these are uh, nothing more than oral tradition, mm. amalgamated from many different sources, and that's why you have these contradictions. Al-Tabari unwittingly helps us out because he basically points out that much of this cannot be trusted. It's, not, it's nothing more than a compilation of many different people's hearings or stories about the prophet that have been embellished or secreted or deleted along the way. And that's probably a part of the reason why you would have, uh, you know, if you've got someone that's written about the life of someone some 200 years later, these are the type of issues that you're going to have. There's so many different stories, so many different traditions. Yeah. It's so far away, so long ago. How do you know which one's true? Remember when we did the series on the emergence of Islam, we talked about uh, Chinese whispers. Yes. Or um, te telephone that you do when you're in a birthday party. Mm. And, uh, you tell someone something in their ear and they tell it to the next person, they tell the next person. By the time it gets about 15, pe 15 people, what that last person tells me is quite a bit different than what I've yes, just told it's you. It's lost. It, it, it's a great, it's yes. a great uh, little game to play in a birthday party. But there's something really serious going on here because that also shows us the difficulty with oral tradition. Mm. Oral tradition, by definition, is open to embellishment, mm -hmm. especially if it's oral tradition that has to do with someone that's great, someone that you respect, someone that's 
that's important to your identity as Muhammad would be for the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And with oral tradition is not only should we sus be suspicious of it and should we not be su surprised if we find different renditions of that uh, of, the, of, the, of the accounts. What else you find is a huge amount of proliferation of these stories. Let me give you an example. Well, we did in the last episode. We talked about al-Buhari. Al-Buhari is given the responsibility in the ninth century to take 600,000 sayings of the Prophet Muhammad and throw out that which he considered to be inauthentic. And he takes it from 600,000 and breaks it down to 7,397, reduces it down to 7,397. So he throws out 98% of it and only retains 2% of it. Wow. Now, my question is, while that may be good in, in, uh, in one sense, what I'd like to ask is, what did he do with the 98%? Mm. I'd like to read that 98%, wouldn't you? Yes, yes. I'd so like to know just, what he threw out. Just mention that figure again. So it's from 7,000 to 600,000 okay. down to 7,397. Wow. Now, my, I would love to know, well, what was his criteria for throwing all the rest out? That's not told. We, he, there's no assessment, no type of criteria. These are the reasons w would make him say yes or no. No, we'll get to, to that. We'll get to okay. that. And, we'll, and that's called, let's hold on to that. Just look at the figures first and, and try to see if this is what Bukhari is doing and that 7,397 that we are now have in, in, uh, in nine volumes, you can get it up on the internet. That's the nine volumes that we do have. That's mm. what's retained. What happened to the other 98%? Hmm. Wouldn't you love to read it? Wouldn't you love to look at it? Wouldn't you yes. like to know what was actually missing? Because there's an awful lot there that would tell us an awful lot about this man named Muhammad. Yes. That we should know. These are his sayings. And that's why I, I, I'm fascinated that Muslims aren't, aren't, uh, aren't not only in, uh, asking this question, but wrestling with it. Because mm. if that were the same case with Jesus Christ, if 98% of everything we knew about Jesus Christ had been thrown away, mm. the saying that he had done, and all we retained is 2%, 2% <laughs> doesn't tell lot. you too yeah. much. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Um, now, Michael Cook actually helps us out with this. In fact, Michael Cook mentions this, and he talks about this proliferation uh, that we see in the biography of the Prophet Muhammad. And he gives the example of the father of Muhammad. His name is Abdullah. Ibn Isak, writing in 765, doesn't say much at all. Uh, basically, just says that Abdullah died early enough to leave Muhammad an orphan. And as to the specific details of his death, God knew best. That's all he says. Al-Wakidi, who uh, takes the material from Ibn Isak, suddenly proliferates. Not only does he talk about the death of Abdullah, but he tells us how he died, where he died, what his age was, and the exact place of his burial. Mm. Michael Cook concludes saying that this evolution in the course of half a century from uncertainty with Ibn Isak to a profusion of precise detail suggests that a fair amount of what Wakidi knew was not knowledge. Mm. And that's a, an ongoing problem. As the writers start writing about Muhammad, they start adding so much detail to his life. It's an exaggeration, yes. Uh, absolutely, or invention. Yes. Certainly invention. And because of that, we need to question it. We need mm. to question as to what's going on here. And it mm. looks like that much of it is being created as, the, as, as they needed to know more. They just created what they needed to know about this man. Mm. Proving that the Muhammad we know is really a Muhammad from the 9th century, not the Muhammad from history, not the Muhammad from the 7th century. That's right. And I think you put it a few episodes ago. You said there's a very big difference between the Muhammad of faith as opposed to the Muhammad of history. Yeah. And so are there any other problems as well? Well, the, uh, the, when Musa, and this is what the question that you asked earlier, how do they and where do they get the material? And why is it that Bukhari used this material and threw out the 98%? Yes. What did he use? Well, Muslims come back to me and they say, well, what he used was the list of names from which that material came from. They, it's known as Isnad. Every akhbar, every saying of the Prophet had a matan, which would be the saying itself, but before the saying would be a list of names from which that matan came from, from where that uh, saying came from. And it was from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from the companion of the Prophet. Mm. And these list of names then were, had schools of authority. And if you have a school of authority that was well known, then that was considered to be sahi. That was considered to be strong. Then there was weak, and then there was that which was considered to be uh, not even usable. Hmm. Now here's the problem. Who says that any of those people said what they said? 
since nothing's written down. <laughs> it could be completely fictitious. And that's why, it, in some ways, it's very similar to Chinese whispers. Yes. Since none of these people wrote anything on what they said down, it's mere speculation as to what, whether any of them are correct. So you're not even critiquing whether it's strong or weak, but you're saying, how do we even know whether it's true or not? That's true. Yes. And of course, then the million dollar question is, and this is what Patricia Corona asks, where did this material come from? Who are these people? And her conclusion is, these are nothing more than storytellers, mm. known, known as kusas. And she then talks about this. Let me quote what she says. She says, these kusas are storytellers who followed upon storyteller. The recollection of the past was reduced to a common stock of stories, themes, and motifs that could be combined and recombined in a profusion of apparent factual accounts. Each combination and recombination would generate new details, and as spurious information accumulated, genuine information would be lost. The absence of an alternative tradition, early scholars were forced to rely on the tales of storytellers, as did Ibn Ishaq in 765. Al-Wakidi in 835 and other historians. It is because they relied on the same repertoire of tales that they all said such similar things. Mm. Now, can you see the implications of what Patricia Corona is saying? If these are nothing more than imaginations of storytellers, well, how do we know any of it's true? That's right. No, yes. all we can say is the Muhammad we do have, the Muhammad that we can rely on, is what the ninth century people believed. But as is it the Muhammad of history? Possibly not. And this is why uh, Robert Spencer came out with his book this year called Did Muhammad Exist? Now that's a provocative title. He's not really asking that question. He wants people to buy the book and that's why he put the, the mm -hmm. title on the front page. He's not really asking whether Muhammad exists. What he's really asking is did the Muhammad of Islam exist, mm. or really the Muhammad that we do know, is he really the Muhammad of history or the Muhammad of faith? And the answer is no. The Muhammad that we're given in all these traditions is nothing more than the Muhammad of faith, the Muhammad that the ninth century men wanted to believe in, wanted to, to create. They wanted this model, and so they created this model. It didn't matter where they got it from. It didn't really matter who they got it from. And that may suggest then, why we don't have anything written earlier. It almost sounds too real. I mean, it, it's, it almost sounds like a conspiracy. Why would anyone want to do that? Well, you, remember what we said in the last series. If you have these Arab conquerors who are conquering uh, regions of the world, and mm -hmm. they conquered very quickly, that's, that's not a doubt. They did go into Basra, they went into Baghdad, they went into Damascus, they went into Jerusalem, they went into Cairo within 10 years of Muhammad's death. Once they went in and they took over these great cities as Arabs themselves, they had to c control these cities and they had to maintain them, and they had to use people that were already there, the people that were living in those cities, the majority of whom uh, were Byzantine, and Sassanid. The Byzantines were Christians. Many of them also were Jews living in those cities. They were the ones who were the experts. They knew how to run a city. They were also the ones who knew how to uh, do politics. They were very good in economics. And so it stood, stands to reason they had to use them. The problem is they also adopted their traditions because they both, both the Jews, Christians, and the Arabs traced their lineage back to Abraham. Mm. One through Isaac, of course, that's us and the Jews, and of course the Arabs through Ishmael to Hagar to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is the case, you've got a problem because if all of your traditions are through Isaac and yet you're an Arab, you're not part of those traditions. Mm -hmm. Those don't really affect you because you're outside of that tradition. What's more, you're seen as the lesser party, yet you are the ones that control. And so you need an Arab identity. How are you going to create that Arab identity? And that's where Abdul al-Malik, we talked about this in the last series, where Abdul al-Malik came in uh, is very important to the story because Abdul al-Malik wanted to create that Arab identity. He's known as the great Arab reformer. And as the Arab reformer, he's the one that eradicated and took out all the echinoclasm and replaced it with Arabic script. Mm. And that's why it's important that we look at Abdul al-Malik who ruled from 685 to 705. During his raid, you get this beginning of an Arab identity. If you have an Arab identity, you need to have an Arab prophet. If you have an Arab prophet, you need to have an Arab revelation. Yes. In the Arabic language. Yes. All of which uh, are focused on the man in the book. The man in the book. Hmm. Who would be the man? Well, they had to re redact it back to who a great man, the great man who started the whole thing. And of course, Muhammad would have been known as that. We do know that the earliest material that we have of Muhammad that even Isak used was called the Maghazi. 
material. Maghazi documents are nothing more than the raids of Muhammad. They talk about his raids. Really, this man was nothing more than a raider. Mm. He was nothing more than a man that would go from raid to raid to raid to raid, conquer and retrieve the booty for himself. But of course, you're going to get a man that's bigger than just a raider. You want a man that also has a revelation. So that's why it stands to reason that in the ninth century, all these stories about him start to get embellished, start to get uh, written down. And of course, you have to have not only that he is a great uh, warrior, he's also a great leader, he's also a great husband, he's also a great lover. And there's reference after reference, as we're going to see later, about how great he was with women. So what you're saying is that he was quite an ordinary p person, maybe a leader at best, but then people had turned him into um, something more than what he actually was. Yes. They glorified him. I would have no doubt as to believe that he even claimed to be a prophet, as every leader of men would claim to be prophets at that time. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not the problem. The problem is, was he the prophet that Islam tells us today? Was he the one that was a universal prophet, that received a universal revelation? Uh, was he the man that created Islam as we know it? I, I remember when we were, I was studying this in, at School of Oriental African Studies in 1994. My professor mentioned that one of the biggest problems that historians are having today is to look at Islam as we know it and all this great sophistication you see in Islam with its laws, rules, and regulations. And there are a lot of laws, rules, and regulations, but many of them could have only been formed in an urban environment. Hmm. And yet Muhammad was in a nomad living in a desert environment. There was no urban area. That's he right. lived in hamlets. Yes. How could you have such a sophisticated a religion like this that had reg rules and regulations for all for every area economic rules and regulations and social rules and regulations and enormous amount of cultural structures uh, that could have been created in a 23 year period in a basically desert rural nomadic environment it didn't make Doesn't sense make sense yes it would make sense much more if this came out of urban settings in the mm. ninth century which is exactly where all these writers are writing mm. and they're not even writing in Arabia as we mentioned earlier, Bukhari from Bukharistan, Tabari from Tabaristan, these are Persian places. These are in present-day Iran and Iraq, mm -hmm. hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years later. Wow. There's this whole image of Muhammad and what he said and did and all the sayings, the th hundreds of thousands of sayings that reduced to just 7,397. These sayings give us a picture of a man who doesn't fit his environment, of a man who doesn't fit his age, of a man who doesn't even fit an Arab in, uh, 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 environment. He much fits much more an Abbasid environment, a ninth century Abbasid environment. Basically what we're saying is the Muhammad uh, that we know is not really an Arab Muhammad, he's a Persian Muhammad. Wow. Put that under your hat. Yes. Because he is created and he is, uh, his traditions and his history and all his sayings are created in a Persian Abbasid era under a Persian Abbasid empire. So you can see the implications and the ramifications of that are start to huge, unfold. Yes. Huge, because it also proves that we don't really have that final Muhammad. So what I can see now is that we've got problem after problem after problem. I mean, are there any more? Well, let's see what the... Um, Let's, let's look and see the conclusions that these Orientalists yes. and these revisionists come up. Let me just quote some of their conclusions because uh -huh. you need to go and see who are the people who are doing the work on it, the people who spend their whole life studying this material and who are unpacking it and actually writing it down for us now mm. in the 21st century. Let's look at some of their conclusions. Uh, Humphreys mentions this and he says that Islam and the Prophet's life as we know it was not derived from the 7th century but evolved over a period of two to 300 years and then re was redacted back onto the prophet's life and compiled in the ninth century. Joseph Schacht, a German scholar, mentions this in his book, The Origins of Muhammad Jewish Brutic. He says this, every legal tradition from the prophet until the contrary is proved must be taken not as an authentic or essentially authentic, even if slightly obscured statement valid for his time or the time of the companions, but as a fictitious expression of a legal document formulated at a later date. Hmm. Now that's a huge mouthful. Let him say that he's the expert, he's the one that's done the research. Patricia Corona and uh, Dr. Michael Cook wrote a book called Hagarism in 1977, hugely co controversial at the time. And their conclusion is that the earliest Maghazi Sura works should be treated as sources for religious ideas current in the 8th century when they were circulated, but not for the life of Muhammad. 
and that's their conclusions. Mm -hmm. Now that's fascinating to me because that's hugely significant for what we're going to do next. Basically what we have done is we have looked at the historical problems for the Prophet Muhammad, similar to the historical problems that we have with the emergence of Islam that Tom Holland was bringing up in his book called In the Shadow of the Sword and also with the documentary that came out this last summer called Islam the Untold Story. That historical critique creates huge havoc as concerning the whole historicity of the Prophet Muhammad. Let's put that aside now. We're going to go to another, a whole nother question in the next episode. And that we're going to look then at saying, fine, we have a problem with Muhammad. Looks like a good bit of it is fictitious. Looks like a good bit of it has been created, concocted over the intervening two to three hundred years. And the Muhammad that we do now have is not the Muhammad of history, he's the Muhammad of faith. Nonetheless, you and I as, as Christians, and we are, we believe in Jesus Christ, we have to look and assess everything from our standpoint. We still need to confront the Muhammad that we do see there that the Muslims believe in. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to change gears. And in the next episode, we're going to now move into this Christian assessment. How do we as Christians assess the Muhammad that we have there, the Muhammad that is still before us, the Muhammad that the Muslims believe in? Because Muslims aren't going to understand this historical material. The vast majority of Muslims around the world don't care diddly swat about the historical questions. Muslims in the West have to, because that's the question they're going to be faced. English-speaking Muslims are going to have to deal with the historical problems. Yes. European Muslims are going to have to deal with the historical problems. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of Muslims around the world, the 1.6 billion who don't ask the historical questions, who don't care about that, they look to this man as their model. They look to this man as their paradigm. They believe that this man, Muhammad, is the model for all people in all places and at all times. How are we going to assess that model? So what we're going to do next now is to actually ask that question. We're going to assume, therefore, that the Muhammad that we're looking at, regardless of whether he's historical or not, this is the Muhammad that they're following. Mm. Can we as Christians still challenge that Muhammad? Now that's going to open up a whole nother can of worms. But as a Christian, I love this because I can either confront Muhammad historically, which is a neutral confrontation. It has nothing to do with whether I'm a Christian or not. Everybody should have to do that. And that's what's called of all historians. We have to confront every major his, uh, religious figure, whether it's Muhammad, whether it's Jesus, uh, whether it's um, the Buddha, uh, whether it's the Hindu gods, uh, or whether it's Joseph Smith, uh, from the Mormons, or Charles Taze Russell from the, uh, from the Russellites, or we know it's Jehovah's Witnesses. Every one of these people that claim to be prophets or claim to be spokesmen for their religion must be confronted historically. Yes. Jesus has been confronted historically. Mm. And Jesus fits the historical co context. Jesus uh, asking these same questions historically about him is the right person at the right time doing the right thing with the right people. Mm. Thank God that Jesus answers that. Why do you think it's so important to be able to compare Jesus with Muhammad? Ah, because Jesus answers every one of the problems Muhammad has, Jesus doesn't have. Hmm. And that's why I love to come back to Jesus, because this quest, these questions about Jesus have already been asked. We've already answered them. We're going to be doing a whole series on Jesus and asking some of the questions in the next series. Yes. But let's stick with Muhammad first before we get to Jesus. And let's go and ask the next questions. Can we look to that Muhammad? as a model for us, for you, for me, for the people who are watching this. Mm. Is that the Muhammad you want to follow? Is that the Muhammad worthy of being a model for today? Is he relevant like Jesus is relevant? Mm. Jay, thank you for your time. Ah, oh, it's good to be here. Thank you. We really hope that you've been challenged by this episode. We want you to just to carry on and to continue watching these episodes, uh, we would hope that you would even write down some of the questions that you have, write down some of the references and go and examine these things for yourself. Don't simply believe what is being said. No, as a person whom God has given a mind to, you should also go and examine these things for yourself. I'm sure that some of the things that are being discussed here are things that you've never heard before and they will challenge you, they will confront you. But don't brush them off aside because this is a question of eternity. This is a question of who am I following? Why do I believe what do I believe? Am I following the God that has revealed himself or am I following someone who has been embellished, someone who uh, 
uh, has been, uh, stories have been uh, told about him. Uh, no one likes to follow uh, mythology. No one likes to follow a character who has been glorified and was no more than an ordinary person. No, we want to follow the truth. So are you following the truth? Please stay in tune for the very next episode of Midnight Cry and God. Thank you.